my name is David Blessing. Um, I solemnly affirm by all that is sacred and righteous that my testimony is given freely and without coercion and is the truth as much as I can recall at this time and nothing but the truth. So help me God. So thank you very much for taking the, the oath. Um, it is a solemn oath, but it's one in which you've affirmed at this point and at this time to tell your testimony to the best of your recollection. Um, if you now in your own words you can begin, we will uh, join you from time to time with questions. Uh, those questions are to discover uh, information that we think will be pertinent to the, to the wider inquest and the wider questions that we're doing. So we're very grateful for you attending today. Um, so if you please begin. Thank you. All right, so um, my ordeal began in 1964 uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, USA, uh, at a church called Holy Name Church uh, in my neighborhood. So uh, my family had just had moved a few months previous to my beginning the first grade. I was six years old. So I was new in the neighborhood. Uh, and I was somewhat um, vulnerable as a child, um, as my home life was uh, a bit um, stressful. I'm not, I mean, I've heard of more stressful situations, but nonetheless. So in this Catholic school, uh, there was a man, as I recall. Oh, I should also add that at that not time, time my family name was Gerald. Uh, my name at that time was Peter Gerald. I changed my name in later years uh, because of just needing to change my life, um, to deal with the stress involved from that ordeal. Anyway, uh, so um, there was a man in, uh, in this school who was really nice to me and gave me a lot of attention. Uh, and... Uh, and as I hadn't been getting that much attention at home, I was really interested in uh, talking to him. And uh, so he um, talked to me for you know a few weeks and uh, said that he proposed that there might be a ceremony uh, in honor of me, uh, and uh, that I was because I was a good boy and I was doing well in school. And, um, and that I should meet him uh, some night, uh, it turned out to be Halloween. Uh, the night before Halloween in 1964, I think it was a Saturday night in October, at the last Saturday and night in October, as I recall. I should add um, a little bit before that. Around this time, the, uh, there were IQ tests being taken in all the schools around the United States. Um, I believe the, the reason for it was to see if the school was working, if IQ was being increased because of the school. But I believe they also used that as a selection tool for children like myself. Anyway, so this man, uh, he said that I should meet him. Uh, in the alley behind my house. There's alleys behind the houses, between the rows of houses uh, in that neighborhood. So um, after I went to bed at night, uh, then my parents were distracted, one you know, watching television or whatever they're doing. And I snuck out behind them and went out the back door and met this man um, uh, in the alley, he was standing behind the garage. There's a garage in the back and then the alley, and he was standing just between the garage and the alley. And I was wearing just uh, my boots, my pajamas, and a jacket. It wasn't very cold uh, at that uh, time. It was unusually warm for Minneapolis at that time of year. Anyway, he uh, like raised his arm, and then a car came from down the alley and came up uh, and, uh, and then picked us up. We got in the back seat. And then I was sitting in the back seat. Uh, and uh, with another man, I think there was two men in the back seat and one in the driving in the front. And we drove then out uh, 
at the end of the alley, I took a right turn to Chicago Avenue, then down Chicago Avenue to 38th Street, and then 38th Street to 11th Avenue, and then back a block to where Holy Name Church is. It's on, I think, 11th and 36th Avenue, somewhere in there, in Minneapolis. So at the back of the church, the basement is on ground level. The front of the church, it's on a hill. So the front of the church, there's a drive up uh, to the um, to the main hall, the church hall, meeting hall. In the back, there is a uh, the rectory. There's a parking lot that during school hours is used as the girls' playground, and because the girls and boys were separated during uh, playground times. Um, so at the back of the church, oh, and then just across the alley from the church is the school, only named school. Anyway, so at the back of the church was a parking lot, and uh, we drove up to that door at the back of the church and went in, and then went into an office. And in the office, they said they had to get ready for the ceremony. Um, I had to take uh, and just have a white robe on, so they took my clothes off and put me in a white robe. And then we went into, uh, in the bar, in the basement of that church, there's a meeting hall, uh, um, uh, of medium size, and um, uh, that's used for various purposes, a multi-purpose room. And um, we went into that room and it was very dark. There were, you know, like tapestries, cloths on the wall, candlelight, low, dim light, dimly lit. And just inside the door to the left, there was a man seated, uh, and he was holding a goat. And there was another man standing. Uh, uh, so he was, he, he was seated, and the goat was on his right. And, and he was um, to the left of the door, uh, and not facing the door. Um, so he was on my left. And then to his right and to the right of the goat, there was another man holding the other horn of the goat. And um, there was also a number of men lined up against the wall behind him and to, his, to the man seated to his left. And they were having animal masks on that were like animals. Like one was like, a, like an elk and one was like, I think, a monkey and one was like a bear. Something like that. I don't remember them all very clearly. Anyway, so he was holding the goat. And then uh, he said, in order to start the ceremony, uh, we had to kill the goat. And I didn't want to kill the goat. And he said, well, you know, you're a big boy. You Don't you eat, uh, eat uh, your father hunts? And he just he made some kind of story that made me feel a little bit guilty for not wanting to kill the goat. And, uh, and so I finally agreed to kill the goat, and uh, they put a knife in my hand, and another adult hand kind of pulled my hand across the throat of the goat. And then they were holding the goat so it wouldn't, like, buck and make a mess. And so then the goat started to bleed out of his neck, and then uh, the guy that was seated, he took, uh, like, a golden chalice, the same kind of goblet you use in a church for mass, for, for the wine and all that. So he took that kind of goblet, and he caught some of the goat's blood, and then he moved it around and kind of mixed it up with something else that was in the goblet. And he said, here, you have to drink this and we can start the ceremony. And um, so I said, okay, okay. And so I drank it. And um, then until that time, they were all very nice and cordial and respectful towards me. And after I drank it, then they started to become uh, rather abusive. And they... Uh, and so, after I drank that one, I began to uh, uh, become very weak. Um, and um, so I began to lose my capacity to stand up. So they sat me on a chair, like a little small couch next to, to the left of the man who had been holding the goat. So the guy that was holding the goat that was seated... He was like the head priest or whatever it was. And the rest of them were more like followers, I think. Anyway, so I sat to his left on this kind of couch as my energy started to run out. 
Uh, and um, then they became very abusive, like, are you worthless kid, you piece of shit, you uh, were, haven't properly served the children of the high families, and uh, you're now, you're dying because you're so useless. And so eventually I became so paralyzed, I couldn't move, I could see, I could hear, I could breathe, but I couldn't move, I couldn't speak. And they finally proclaimed me dead. This kid is dead. He's so useless, he died. And they picked me up and put me in a box that was just behind this couch. And they put me in a box. Uh, I don't know what it was made of, maybe cardboard. And they put kind of a bowl or something over my face so that I could still breathe. And they buried me in dirt. They said, he's useless. We just better bury him. Otherwise, he'll just stink. And so they buried me in dirt. And I'm laying in the box and totally, absolutely terrified. And believing that I was dead and my mind split. So from that point on, I was seeing the whole thing from two perspectives. One from the perspective of watching it from the ceiling and the other perspective of being in my body. And um, so I'm laying in the box and the part of me that's in the box is thinking that this is what death is like. I'm just absolutely certain that I'm dead. I'm totally dark, but I can still hear what kind of what's going on in the room. Uh, I can't see anything because there's dirt over this bowl that's over my face. And from the ceiling, I'm just very dispassionate, just seeing, okay, there's this, I am in the box, I must be dead, this is what death is like. And um, then somebody comes into the room and says, where's that boy? I like that boy, I, what happened to him? And then another voice says, he was useless, he died. He, was, he, he died of uselessness. And the guy said, well, the other voice said, well, do you think he'll agree to uh, serve the children of the high families? Maybe we can resurrect him. And the other voice said, well, I'll ask him. He said, oh boy, will you agree to serve the children of the high families as long as you uh, live, as long as you hold breath on this earth? And I wasn't really thinking, uh, but then the guy says, well, I think he'll agree to that. I think he'll agree. So then they pulled me out of the box and they said, um, okay, now, um, now we're, we have to wash away your sins. So then they put me in just so, just the, um, uh, progressing from the door where I entered. On the left, there was the men where they were holding the goat. Then there was the couch. Then behind the couch, there was the box. And then a little bit farther into the room, towards the back wall, there were like three vats, well, two vats, and then like a small river pool. Anyway, the first vat on the left, um, they put me in, and then they were going to wash my sins, and so they pissed on me. And one of them, and they were laughing, one of them turned around and shat on me, and then another one pissed on that to wash that away. And that was uh, washing away my sins. Then they took me out of that vat, put me in the next one, um, which was to the right from the perspective of the door to the left of that first vat, way that vat. And then there was the guy that, um, I think it was the guy that talked to me in school. He was like the lowest guy in the totem pole. Um, and then he gave me a bath, like a soap and water bath. And, um, uh, and then, oh, so after I killed the goat, then they took away the rope because um, it had blood on it. So, um, uh, oh. so I took away the, go uh, the robe, so I was naked after that point. Um, so then they gave me the soap and water bath. Then, um, then after that, then took me out of that one and put me in like a small rubber pool, like kids play in, in the yard. And then, um, and then rub me all with oil. So like some kind of oil they rub me all down with. And, um, and as the oil, as, as the guy was rubbing me with oil all over the oil, then I started, the, the drug started to wear off. And I think it started to wear off a little bit early. But anyway, I kind of stood up and looked at two guys that were to my left and a little bit in front of me. And one was sitting by a small table, and another one was standing to the uh, to my right, uh, to the uh, left of the table, um, which was um, 
as you're entering the room, again, from the door's perspective to the right, uh, towards the back wall. Anyway, so as I stood up and looked at them, then the guy that was standing picked up a book, a big book off of the table, and then Lord stood, kind of rushed up and hit me in the side of the head and knocked me down and said, thou shalt not look upon our faces, like that. Anyway, then... Um, then they kind of picked me up because I was pretty stunned by that. Uh, they picked me up and said, oh, here, drink this. Then they gave me something else to drink. Then they picked me up and put me on a table. And this table, um, it's hard to get perspective on that table. I think it was kind of in the middle of the room in front of, um, closer to the door than those vats were. Anyway, they put me on a small table, like maybe like an end table, you know, not very high off the floor. Um, something that you'd have next to a couch, you know, a low table, a small table. They put me on that, but it was big enough that I could just kind of lie on it. And as they put me on the table, they started to do some chanting. They're chanting blah, 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 this kind of a drone thing, a uh, droning chant. And as they were doing that, then I started to feel like really big. And the part of my mind that was on the ceiling and the part of my mind that was on the table kind of got joined and I felt like a big goat. So I could feel like I had horns that were like bumping on the ceiling and I had a snout that was kind of hairy and I had hairy thighs and hooves that were standing on the table and really strong chest. And I felt really big and strong and powerful. And they were bowing and bowing, like worshiping me. Like, and I felt, wow, I'm really important here. And then they stopped chanting and then boom, I'm just a little boy laying on the table again. The ceremony was calling forth the beast. They, like, they had like names for each step of this ceremony. You know, it was... Um, the death and the uh, uh, then the washing away the sins, and then uh, preparation for redemption, and then calling forth the beast, and then the redemption ceremony. Anyway, so um, after they uh, after they did all that worshipy thing, and then I was again just the boy sitting on the table. <clears throat> Uh, then it was time for the redemption ceremony. And then it was just a sex orgy, really. I was just like the main sex toy. I think there were other children there. Um, part, in part of this memory, there's some children in the beginning and other children at the end. I don't know if that's a projection. I don't have a clear memory of that. But I do think there were other children there as well. But during that whole ordeal, it was too terrifying for me to think about much else but my own experience. But then, you know, they were just having sex with each other and having sex with me. And then I got semen all over me, covered. I, you know, the, the head guy, the, lead, the head priest had a very small penis, uh, which he used to, uh, uh, to fuck me in the ass. And um, pardon my language, but that's what it was. And um, and that went most of the night. The, the other, the beginning parts, you know, they were maybe, I don't know, a shorter period of time, but most of the night was the whole the sex orgy thing. And then I was just covered in semen head to toe, um, just dripping in my eyes and my mouth and my throat and my stomach, and blah, every place. It was disgusting. Then... Uh, and then at some point, um, I was taken out of the room, wrapped in a blanket, taken out of the room to a bathroom, you know, like with a bathtub and a shower and all, and given a bath. And I vomited all the stuff out of my stomach and um, a whole bath and washed out my eyes and everything. Anyway, then they brought me back into the room and put in a clean white robe. And then, um, then there was in the room, like a, a dresser, like a chest of drawers you'd find that you'd, in your bedroom where you'd put your clothes, and then a mirror. And so I, could, I was standing in front of this in a white robe, and just at eye level, my eye level as a six-year-old, was the top of the dresser, and on the dresser was the head of the goat. 
And then behind the head of the goat was a mirror, like, you know, the kind you see on the dresser in the bedroom. And on this mirror were family photos of people that I didn't know. You know, people, just family photos. People, you know, out hunting with hunting rifles, smiling, swimming, I don't know, whatever they were doing in their family photos. And then was, they gave me a knife to hold. And it was a sword. For me as a six-year-old, it was as big as a sword. And I saw swimming in front of me. And um, then I had to take this oath to uphold the honor and dignity and serve the children of the high families as long as I hold breath on this earth. And um, then, so that, that uh, it, from the perspective of the entry door, that dress was on the right towards the middle of the room. And then I was turned to the right from facing that dresser, turned to the right, and there was a man there with a watch, and he was waving it in front of my face, saying, uh, so you are sleepy, you won't remember anything that you've heard or seen in this uh, at this time. Uh, and so it was some kind of a hypnosis thing. Then I was turned uh, again to the right, so I'm now facing the starting point where the guy was in the beginning and was holding the goat. And to his right, um, there was a table. No, actually, he's behind the table now. And he's holding a boy. And there's a boy sitting on the table. And the boy has got brown skin. And he can barely hold his head up. He's just like, just like drugged or something. And... And I believe at this time, I recall there being other children there. There's a vague memory of that. But he says, then, if you uh, if you remember what you see uh, this night, then he stabbed the boy in the eyes, and his eyes started to bleed. And um, I think he stabbed the boy in the ears, if you remember what you hear. And then, and then if you tell anyone... And he stabbed the boy in the mouth, and he started to bleed out of the mouth. Then, uh, then anyone you tell, then he just stabbed the boy from the back. And then he put the knife through the boy's back and came right out of his stomach, just below his sternum. And the knife came right out, and the boy died. Then he pulled the knife out, and then... Uh, and then they took me out of the room, and they started to cut the boy up into pieces. Anyway, they took me out of the room, then down the hall to where we had started in the office, and they took out the robe, off the robe, and put me back. I had them again, my boots, my pajamas, my jacket. And then we went out into the parking lot again. And they brought the bags with the boy's body in it. They brought them out and gave them to a policeman. There was a, ca a police car there. And two policemen, and the policeman took the bag, put him in the trunk, and drove away. And then I got in this black car again. It's like an old, you know, at that time it would have been a new, I think maybe a Cadillac or a Chevy. It was in a big American car, black car. And then they drove me back uh, home. And, um, and then I got out of the car and went into the backyard of my house. And then I'm in the yard, and I don't know why I'm there. And from that time, I don't remember, you know, anything that had happened at that night. And I'm standing in the backyard and wondering why I'm there. And there's just barely getting a little bit gray, that gray early dawn light on the horizon. And, um, and I didn't know why I was there, so I went into the house and went to bed. And then a little bit later... I got up and watched cartoons. A Sunday morning, there's cartoons on television that I, that I like to watch, and I watch those cartoons. So that was that first night of what happened to me. And then, every six months or so, my mother would bring me to uh, get a dental checkup at the University of Minnesota. And... Um, then I would be brought into the dentist's chair, into the place where the dentist would do the drilling or whatever it is, the x-rays and all. And then my mother would go out into the waiting room. 
And um, then someone would come in and say something, and I would go into a trance, and they would take me down the hall. The room was on the right at the end of the hall, and then in that room there was, I would, they would put a cap on my head, and, uh, and there were wires from the cap that would go to a machine that would measure my brain waves. And then I would, they'd show me images on the wall. And I would watch these images on the wall, and then according to how my brain waves responded to these images, I would get electric shocks. So the electric shocks right there. And um, so images of people, you know, feeling success, boom, electric shock. Images of people in a family situation having a nice time, boom, electric shock. Images of things blowing up, no electric shock. Images of people killing each other, no electric shock. So like this, they were trying to condition me. Um, and that went on once or twice a year until I was about 13 or 14. And um, oh, there was another thing that happened that I remember that's somewhat related to this, maybe tangentially, I don't know, but that was in the Basilica in St. Paul. So I remember the big round stage in the last window. I was about 12, I think. And it was a black mess. I remember men in black robes with gold medallions and chains. Some of the chains were around their necks and some were around their waists, and they had them these gold medallions and black robes with hoods, so you couldn't see their faces. The hood was kind of dumb. And they were lined up all on the walls, and then they filed out. That's what I remember. But then there was this kind of overnight thing with all sex inside the church. I guess that's called a black mass or something. But that's about as much of all that stuff that I remember. That I can remember right now, anyway. But I guess the result of that might be pertinent. You know, I've struggled in my life with feelings that I should blow things up and a difficulty maintaining relationships or maintaining any kind of a steady employment um, until I learned to meditate. When, you know, in, in my early 20s, I realized that my life wasn't working. I wasn't able to maintain relationships or maintain any kind of income. So I found a meditation teacher, I learned to meditate, and then I started to tour the world with this meditation organization, practicing meditation, doing service projects, and that's what really saved my life. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for that testimony. It's very full and uh, very useful. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to pass this over to uh, one, one of our, our, our team who's very, very expert in this area. All right. Queen, can you please um, consider what's been said and perhaps uh, uh, consider if there's anything you'd like to add or some questions you'd like to ask? Well, indeed, I, um, I noted some questions to clarify a bit for the people who are watching this, um, because I can imagine it must be very confusing. Uh, we have here a man of his, almost his 60s, I think, remembering all his life what happened 54 years ago. This is not easy because try to remember what you did when you were six years old. Um, the most traumatic things though um, can be um, stocked in, in the memory. I don't know what happened to you, David, that these memories came back. Did you have those memories all the time? Or were you just feeling bad with yourself, uh, confused, not knowing why? Uh, or did parts of what they did to you, and I don't like you to say what happened to me, there were people who decided to do to you what they did uh, in food consciousness. It is yes. not something that happened. That's they a very good question. You. So please use the words, what they did to me. This sure. is more appropriate. So I would like to know from you um, if you have these memories um, from very young age already, or did something happen into your life where all these memories came back? Thank you. Yes. So um, I didn't remember any of that until I was 46. So this was in 2004, I believe, I began to remember it. 
Um, so most of my adult life, most of my adult life, I suffered from, well, as a child, um, I started self-medicating because I didn't remember it. I just had this terrible angst. I had a terrible pain in my stomach that caused me to eat huge quantities of food. So as a 10-year-old, I could eat a pound loaf of bread and a dozen eggs uh, without any problem. And by the time I was 12 years old, I had begun smoking marijuana and drinking a lot and um, even huffing glue and paint um, just because it seemed like an enjoyable thing to do. I had otherwise so much tension. Then um, I quit, you know, the glue after, you know, just not very long, less than a year, but I continued drinking and smoking, drinking alcohol and smoking pot until my early 20s um, without any memory of what had been happening to me, just knowing that I felt very uncomfortable inside. And that's when I learned meditation. And then after learning meditation, I quit all of the drugs, but I continued to eat too much. I would, in social situations, I would become so anxious that I would uh, eat uh, incredible amounts of food until um, uh, until my stomach hurt. And then after, you know, like if it was a social gathering, after people would leave, then I wouldn't be able to sleep, so I'd have to vomit. So I had bulimia most of that time. And then I had chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, and the chronic fatigue syndrome would be a problem for two weeks to a month which uh, made it very difficult for me to maintain re, you know, any kind of a job or anything. But um, I continued to meditate regularly, meditate, yoga, vegetarian diet, um, you know, uh, no non-toxic, I wouldn't take anything, no drugs of any kind. And I think that cleaned my mind out enough that um, in 2004, um, I was able, the memory started to come up. I was in university. There was a couple of things going on, you know, the regular meditation, yoga, clean diet. I was in something called Landmark Education, which was all about integrity. And, uh, uh, I was taking classes there. And I was in university studying a class on, um, on alternative medicine. And um, as I was doing research for a thesis, a paper, a term paper, um, my theory was that people who participate in communities of some kind of a community, have community connections, are going to be happier than those who are loners. And me being a loner, why? Anyway. So as I was doing research on that, I started to be overwhelmed by a terrible sensation. It was the sensation I felt, and the image I had was like being a piece of meat in a, in a deli uh, case, you know, in a meat market. And as I was uh, doing this paper, this sensation came up. I couldn't uh, do the paper because it was such a horrible, disgusting sensation. And I went to see a counselor at the university. And as I was talking to the counselor, then I started to have these memories that something happened in this church. It happened in the church basement. It happened in this room in the church basement. So the memories started to move slowly, little bit by little bit. And eventually this whole scenario started to uh, be recalled in my mind. Mm -hmm. Until when? Until what age uh, did this abuse continue? Do you remember uh, when it stopped? Yeah, around 14. Why? I don't know. I just, I remember there being, well, there was a couple of things were happening at that time. One, I do have some memory of a man asking me for my forgiveness and then killing himself. And I think that happened in, in this dentist office scenario down the hall. And it was just, it's like a flashing memory. Um, but then around that same time, the Freedom of Information Act, there were journalists were getting wind of this. And there's a thing in America law called the Freedom of Information Act, where if you request documents from the government, the government is compelled to supply those documents. And so, um, this uh, MK Ultra and all these uh, things were starting to come into uh, uh, into public awareness, mm -hmm. and uh, I believe that's when they started then to to 
bury these things because I don't think they had much success with it. Um, you know, I think more likely people like myself would have committed suicide or or, or just, you know, uh, become homeless and, and drug addicted. Drug addicted. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think their program had very much success. I think they just buried it and forgot about it as much as they could. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I just know what uh, what they did to me and uh, and uh, and why it stopped uh, honestly if they had been tracking me for years after that i honestly don't, i don't have any evidence of it it is very probably uh, because we saw that i've seen that in all these years with many victims apparently from the moment we are born we are somehow registered and followed uh, not all of us but some of us do um so at a certain point, it stopped. Um, and then you were left to yourself. Now, yeah. it is very easy for them because they know that you are so, if I can use your words, fucked up as a child. They know how it, what is going to happen. There are two possibilities. Whether they will take you in to fulfill, um, to fulfill some jobs where they continue using you. You can be a minister, you can be a politician, uh, it doesn't matter what. They will put you in places where they can control you and uh, you, you, will, you will probably be more like a filter then. So for instance, you could be a, a commissioner of child uh, protection and uh, people who come to your office to complain about something happening to their child, it depends if it is um, it is a case that could bother them or that could discredit them. You will you will know what to do. You have to bury it. If it is the neighbor who abused the child, you will advocate for a uh, right to be done. That's what we see in practice. The other children who are uh, destroyed because they destroy these children, they indeed start having alcohol problems, uh, drug abuse. They go in prostitution. Um, in fact, they fail all the time, or they, they go into psychiatric or mental institutions. And in all these cases, the victims are um, automatically discredited because of their statue. Oh, but he has been in a, psych in a mental health hospital. Oh, but he's seeing a psychiatrist. Oh, but. I don't know anything about that um, because, uh, you know, from a childhood, I always had this sensation or this idea that I did not want to be successful because they would get me. There was just this thing that played in my mind. I don't know where it came from, but I avoided any kind of uh, any kind of opportunities that came my way. Um, to as you know, I got out of high school. I I couldn't really go through college because I would get too depressed to take tests or complete papers. So um, I just had the sense that I really needed to avoid any kind of position that could be interpreted as successful. Yeah, like, well, maybe it was your maybe it was your subconscious warning you. Uh, like you but all these other things that you're describing, I don't know. That's your testimony, but, but I, I don't know about it. But um, what's quite interesting um, was your reference previously to uh, the the IQ test. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that there was an IQ test and that precipitated um, the, the awful occurrences that occurred to you. Um, yeah. So I think perhaps, do you think perhaps that that may have been part of your warning? I, I don't know. I was a six-year-old. They, they put a test in front of me and I took it. And I, I don't know. I, just I know. Think that, yeah, I think you're right, Chris, because um, I know from uh, children... And, with, and, and it's, it's very unfortunate, but the church has been used by evil people to do these jobs. But the priests in all parishes uh, were ordered to go into to the schools and pick, and pick out the most intelligent uh, pupils. And those children, uh, then they went to, to visit the parents and say, we, we can help your child to be a very good educated boy. Uh, I, I know it especially for boys. And then they put them in border schools where these children are constantly abused. But they, when they get out of these, these 
elite schools, um, they have jobs for them. So it, it starts very early on when these children are five, six, seven years, they are followed. They, they get these IQ tests, they get other tests, uh, they, they observe you in sports, in everything these children do. And then when they think this is a good, this is a good subject for our project or evil project, um, they go and see the parents. And the children, the bad thing is that for the children, it seems as if their parents have sold them which is not true because these, these parents, in not all cases, but in most of these cases, they thought that this was the best to do for their children. They believed the priests. And then these like children were picked up and put in boarding schools where, yes. where the rest of their lives were, were, were um, programmed. I understand. Well, I was never in a boarding school. Um, the, the, uh, the initial idea that happened when I was six years old there were none of the normal clergy because, you know, the school at that time was taught mostly by nuns and uh, priests. Well, not priests, but the nuns were teaching in the school and the priests were, you know, doing their thing in the church. The ones, the only one that was present at that time was the one who I talked to in school. Mm -hmm. The rest of the, the, like the pastor and the other more senior assistant priest and all of the nuns were gone that weekend on some retreat. So there was only the one there that was like supposed to be the caretaker, but was the one that was uh, allowing the other, allowing all this to go on. And as far as my parents, I have no information or knowledge or evidence that my parents were in any way involved um, in this whole thing. No, it's all, not always the case, but there seems to be um, a pattern in it. In, in, in many cases, churches are involved, not only Catholic churches, but, but others too. We've heard the testimony of Christy, and there again, it was the Mormon church. Um, there, is, there seemed to be um, a pattern in it. We'll find out with all the testimonies of these faith people, because you have to admit to yourself that you are a very, very strong man. Being able to survive this, being able to stay saying, mentally saying, uh, is already an achievement. And you, okay, you, you, you used alcohol, you used drugs, you used uh, whatever, but you were able to get off of all this alone, on your own. So you must be a very, very uh, strong man. Well, thank you for saying that. No, I mean it. Accept it also. You have the right to accept uh, sure. the positive things too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I yeah, do you have, still have a question, Chris? No, I think, I think that's been uh, uh, excellently examined um, and also uh, very f uh, fully given as well in regard to a testimony, sir. i uh, been very obliged for that. Um, it may well be that in the future we ask you to come back. Uh, maybe we have some more questions. I'm um, sure, no problem. And I'd be obliged to thank you very much for giving that indication that you, you would be available. Uh, as we piece these pieces together and we bring together the different parts of testimony of these stories, as, as Corinne has said, a pattern is emerging. Um, we're very much at the beginning of that uh, exploration for this inquiry. Um, but your piece that you put in here is very much appreciated and I want you to know that. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.